God, the most gracious, most merciful, thank you all uh, for coming. And uh, thanks to the Flag Institute for inviting me to give uh, a, a Muslim perspective on the Union Jack. Which I think it's something that's not really uh, heard much of regarding uh, what is the, you know, the Muslim opinion regarding many uh, kind of uh, famous British institutions. Of course, the, the, the Union Jack being one of the foremost. Before I, I discuss what the Muslim perspective on the Union Jack is, the Union Jack obviously being uh, a flag of the, of the country United Kingdom, I want to give what the Muslim perspective is on uh, flags in general, how uh, traditionally uh, Islam has, uh, or Islamic culture has viewed flags and banners. I think that traditionally, uh, from the Arabian Peninsula in the 7th century, uh, flags have always been viewed as uh, items which were mainly carried into war, mainly carried into battle. Um, you have your, uh, your, your your battle standard of your your tribe, the, your tribal flag would be brought into the battle. It would distinguish you from the enemy. It would be a, a cause to rally your, your troops. It would be a cause to uh, inspire fear in the enemy when they see your colours flying on the battlefield. Much like a lot of other cultures, and in the Islamic culture, which was kind of born out of this context, um, the flag was essentially a tool uh, which was used for uh, warfare. And it had it always been used since until the time of the um, of the Umayyad and Abbasid Caliphates. When it came, when the Umayyad and Abbasid Caliphates came in the Middle East, which was spread from uh, from Iraq and uh, Persia all the way to obviously Morocco and so on, all the way to India as well, they encountered other cultures and they learned how to use flags, or rather, they they were they kind of uh, saw that the Persian uh, the Persian Empire, the Byzantine Empire. Flags are used more for kind of uh, pomp, for circumstance, for it was a, a form of ostentation that the, uh, the degree of your state, the degree of your empire would, uh, would be basically proportional to other empires in terms of stature and your flags have to represent that, that kind of uh, your, your social standing, your international standing and so on. So the more flags you had at battle, the more flags uh, you had, the bigger the flags they were, then uh, the more uh, higher in status your nation is <coughs> now in terms of the the kind of you know Muslim viewpoint of flags and uh, and uh, semiosis, the Islamic flags which you probably see in, in, in the news, unfortunately associated to uh, were hijacked by I think some people which are not entirely desirable to actually should to represent that flag. The Islamic flag is generally a white flag. And semiosis is, is not very complicated, it's very simple, it just has some Arabic writing which says there is no God except the one God. The white flag with the black writing would symbolize peace and would only be used at a time of, in, in peacetime, and the, the black flag with white writing, which you probably see in the, uh, in the news, is obviously uh, symbolizing war, it was, it's a flag used for war, and the, the, kind of the black color was meant to co uh, connote uh, kind of mourning, it was meant to be a, a bad thing, a sad thing, that life would be taken in a battlefield, and hence the, the flag color was, was actually black, the, the color of mourning. Now, this is the kind of the Islamic perspective to flags. Flags were just a kind of a, a tool. Um, they weren't seen as something that you fly all the time, and you fly the colors all the time, because essentially, you know, the, the, the nation or society you come from is uh, obviously, you're, you live in that society. There's no need to kind of remind yourselves of this group consciousness and represent the fire flag. The only time you represent it would be on the battlefield when you can see there's a difference, there's a clash between two different, you could say, nations or tribes and so on. Then obviously the importance of uh, identification of your nation or tribe would become uh, very uh, important in for the battlefield. So, in that kind of sense, um, when we're looking at now going on to the, uh, the the British flag, looking at the British flag from a kind of Muslim perspective, there's a, a different, there's a few kind of uh, perspe perspectives on it, different angles depending on how you view it. Because obviously, a flag in its very basic essence is a cloth; it has printed colours on it and, and so on, and that's all it is. But it's the significance we give to uh, the flag, the significance we give to the symbols, and of course. Flags, uh, the, 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 well, whatever the flag represents, changes over time as well. For example, obviously, obviously we know that historically, uh, the Union flag is a composite of the, uh, of the St. George Cross and St. Andrew's Cross and St. Patrick's Cross. 
Uh, St. David didn't make it into that, apparently, but, uh, <laughs> um, so poor Wales. But, uh, so obviously the, the, the basis for the, for the, the, the flag in, in history is, is, is a Christian basis, based on Christian theology. Uh, obviously Muslims don't really remember, we don't remember um, a, a kind of a, a group of religious fanatics or free brutus or opportunists who came to the Middle East sporting the red, a red cross on a white background. Um, except in films, of course. So there is no negative connotations that perhaps the flag, of, uh, the English flag, uh, on its own would give to a, a Muslim, because obviously we don't we don't have it etched on our memory what this, the, the Knights Templar flag and so on. But so, but that was a, a, even that being the case, the Christian context of the UK of the Union Jack no longer, you could say, applies to the UK. Even though the UK obviously has the established Church of England, even though obviously there are clerics represented in the House of Lords and the Queen as a defender of the faith. Britain is a secular country uh, now, and uh, it, it would seem that its Christian past is no, no, no longer um, kind of connected to it, obviously it's on the, the secular future. Whether that's a good or bad thing is um, for another discussion. But uh, certainly, obviously all flags have some of their history, some of their culture and their religion uh, um, still kind of present, still preserved on the flag itself, which is quite an interesting uh, factor, but it's, but it's of no significance uh, to us today, I suppose, because especially for Muslims, we don't look at the British flag as always oh, got Christian cross on it. It's just a uh, uh, symbolic tree. It's just something that came from uh, Britain's past. But obviously, because the Britain, the secular context, it no longer it has uh, that t uh, significance attached to it. The political context of looking at the, uh, the, the British flag in uh, for for a, in a Muslim. And I think uh, a lot of people don't understand this. Um, for Muslims, we're not uh, we're not nationalists. We're not nationalists to, to any particular country, whether it be Pakistan or Saudi Arabia or Morocco or France or, or, or so on. Because in Islam, there's this uh, emphasis of the you know the tribe of Adam, the, the people of Adam. We're all human beings. We're all the people of Adam. Called the, what the Arabic is called Bani Adam. When there was one, uh, when the Prophet Muhammad uh, so encountered a very haughty Arab who was uh, having a go at this foreign, a non-Arab guy, saying, "We are, I'm an Arab, I'm superior to you." The Prophet Muhammad uh, rebuked him and said that, you know, Adam wasn't Arab, and Adam came from mud, trying to uh, play. Obviously, one of the, the kind of obviously there's a similarity between the Bible and the and the Quranic narrative of Adam being made from clay or being made from mud, and saying that all your pride of your ancestry uh, is is silly because Adam wasn't wasn't British, wasn't Arab, wasn't. Uh, uh, whatever, wasn't French, wasn't what have you. And so you being proud of your particular nation is irrelevant. And that Adam had a kind of uh, almost a, a almost slightly ignoble uh, uh, source of his, for his creation, mud or clay, and something like that comes from the earth. So in that sense, um, nationalism or pride or, or what I call kind of the extension of one's ego to incorporate the political entity that you live in is something that Muslims uh, can't do, mainly because I, I would say that we are humanitarian. So for us, um, we don't, we don't, uh, when we, we, we see Muslims advising each other, saying that, oh, you shouldn't take the British flag as a source of pride, it is not because of the British flag specifically. It's rather that all flags, including Muslim countries' flags and every single flag in the whole world, we can't say we take a pride in this because we had no choice where we are born. So if you have no choice where you're born, then how can you take pride out of something which is exclusive, where not every human being can engage in? And hence, from that perspective, we don't view as the, uh, the British flag as a source of, of, uh, of pride, um, although it might represent, obviously, uh, England, and you might say England has a glorious history, and most, a lot of nations have glorious histories, but it's, it's because of our, you could say, humanitarian approach to mankind that we are forbidden to look at it from a, a sort of pride and say, these are my colors, and so on. The other perspective is, uh, I guess you could say, theological, and this is very interesting, and this is also replicated in a lot of Christian discourse as well. It's essentially um, you know, taking flags as, uh, as idols. Um, some people, they view their flag or their country, and it could be any country in the world, and somehow the flag has, is more than just um, a flag, it's more than just a, a, a symbol that represents something. It becomes almost virtually uh, a form of a kind of idolatry in a way. And what I mean by this is, uh, some people, they, they, they have such a faith in this kind of uh, transcendent thing called their nation, this their nation, they say, oh, my nation is eternal, their nation is omnipotent. And if this flag almost becomes the icon, the, 
the uh, physical manifestation of this so-called divine consciousness, which is called the nation. And in that sense, and the Christian, in Christian discourse as well, both in America and in England, which I was researching very interestingly, has the same kind of understanding, do not take graven images besides, besides your Lord, which is one of the Ten Commandments. So from that perspective, we also, uh, the Muslims, we wouldn't view the, the British flag in terms of uh, something which is uh, an idol, something that we have to uh, treat in a kind of uh, a reverence, uh, that we would treat a, a, a cross or or the, the Quran or the Jewish Holy Scriptures or things like this. We, this is this is something that we, that uh, some people have noticed is a kind of almost modern form of idolatry. I think the sociologist Emil Durkheim used to his their, his explanation for religion was that religion was a social glue that essentially put in place was put in place by society that personifies its agreement on uh, the values and then turns it into a god. In some ways, modern day nationalism is, uh, is by, for some people's perspective, quite the opposite, similar to that, and all the, all the way around. It's as you turn the nation into some kind of uh, transcendent, uh, universal, omnipotent being, and then it becomes some kind of god personified into this uh, symbolism, which is known as the national flag. So as Muslims, we can't, uh, we don't view it in that sense. So what do we view? I've been spending a lot of time telling you what we don't view it as. <laughs> now, what do we view um, the British flag as? Well, in the uh, verse in the Quran, it says that God created mankind into nations and tribes that you may recognize each other. And in that verse, there's an implicit corollary, which, may, which is basically not that you might despise each other or be prideful over each other. And then it says, those noble in the sight of God are those who are righteous, or you could say those who are moral. Now, in that sense, when God made us into nations and tribes, made us into different, you know, different uh, groups around the, the world, so that we might recognize each other, so that we might identify each other's distinctiveness. <coughs> Variety allows us to be, look, you know, look different. The reason why you can recognize your friends today is because your, your friends look different to you. If everyone looked exactly the same, like clones, we couldn't recognize each other. So indifference comes the ability to, uh, to come to individuality, comes the ability to recognize others. And in that sense, the Union Jack, um, how Muslims we view uh, flags or banners is um, you know, emblems for the identification of the nations they come from. So when, I, when we see the, the uh, Union Jack, we say, okay, this is uh, identification, it's like a unique identification for a particular nation of people uh, on earth, which will in this case be the British nation. And this is how um, the Islam would view all kinds of flags. In fact, the flags are, very, are, are just essentially function, uh, functional in that sense. In, the, in some ways you could say, quite mundane Islamic view of it is essentially just for an identification badge to say you are from this particular uh, part of the world. Isn't it interesting when you communicate with other human beings, uh, just you meet a complete stranger at the airport, what's the first question you ask? You know, well, where are you from? Isn't it? So where are you from is the first question you ask. It's like to, to, before you get, know any information on this person, in, before you build any kind of database in your mind about what this person is, the first question you ask is where are you from? Uh, this is uh, how human beings naturally identify each other is from where we're we from, and flags are very much a, a means uh, to re represent uh, symbolically that question and, and provide the answer. Thank you. I'm sure there can be lots of questions. Yeah, oh, sorry, no, right. Um, I've done a lot of travelling in the United States recently, um, and I'm kind of interested in your view of, uh, actually, yeah, my, my wife is uh, a United States citizen, and um, as you know, they, uh, they have this kind of um, whole culture of um, pledging allegiance to the flag. I was wondering how, whether you had any kind of view on the Muslim perspective of that. Pledging allegiance to the flag? Yeah. Um, well, interestingly enough, there's, there is a lot of Christian discourse about that same uh, issue, and it's of course quite a problem because uh, Christians have been discussing is that a form of idolatry to pledge allegiance to a, a flag, an object, um, or some kind of abstract concept of nation. Obviously, a, a Christian uh, will be uh, patriotic, um, they will be faithful to their nation. Obviously, the famous Romans 13, Christians should be obeying the, the, the country. But, uh, well, by, by the laws rather, but pledging your allegiance to a, a flag is a bit of a discussion. And in Muslim discourse, it's the same. We, we kind of mimic that. And also in uh, Jewish discourse as well, it's actually quite the same. I would say that um, I, as Muslims, we, we wouldn't pledge our allegiance to, to a flag. We pledge our allegiance to, uh, you could say, uh, well, to God first, as uh, I think it was um, 
uh, Thomas More. Thomas More said uh, when he was questioned by the, the king and when he didn't want to go, what, what the queen, king wanted to do, and he said that you know I'm the king's good servant, but I'm God's first. And in that sense, uh, Muslim, Jewish, and Christian, we we kind of have that same kind of Abrahamic uh, kind of origin and that same kind of opinion on that. Um, when it comes to obviously, I guess in the modern day, the modern day state example, we'd be obviously law-abiding citizens of the state, but uh, we pledge our allegiance first to God, and we kind of are in the service of humanity in general. But obviously, if we live in uh, the country, for example, Britain or America, then obviously our service to humanity, we can't obviously, I can't help someone all the way in Mongolia, because I don't know what's happening in Mongolia. So I have to help those people I see in front of me uh, right here. But I wouldn't make a distinction based on nationalism, nationalism because I think all human beings are equal, no matter where they're from. But obviously, while, while we are here, and we have, we're surrounded by, obviously, the, the people of the British nation, we are also help, we are helpful to our fellow human beings, because those, they are around us. Yeah. Thank you. Have you got <coughs> Just in, in, in contrast to that, uh, you, you're right about the American flag and sort of pledging allegiance to it and focusing on it. I was thinking, would it be uh, to you uh, a better like, cultural protocol in a sense to take more what, I, what I've seen as the, the European lowlands, sort of Belgium, Netherlands approach, where they seem to have a community flag, uh, a county flag, a country flag, and a continent flag in Europe, and they they fly them side by side. So it, it's rather, rather than pledging allegiance to one flag, it, it's showing the sort of <coughs> identification of different areas. Uh, and, and I certainly believe that um, if you were to have like an earth flag on, on top of that, you would have the sort of, these are identifications, we can be proud of these little areas, but we are of this, whether it's sort of a high flag or whether it's the earth, would, would that be a better sort of flag blown culture for, for, for you? Well, you know, it's very interesting, you know, London has a, a coat of arms, for example, and Birmingham and Manchester have their own coat of arms. Most people who live in London couldn't tell you what the coat of arms of London looks like. Mm -hmm. The general, general people, this is, this is interesting. Um, because although it exists, it's not seen as almost, a, it's almost seen as something trivial uh, to, to memorize, to know, to someone. Obviously you might see it on the streets, but no one really remembers it if I, could, if I tell someone to draw it. And that's because obviously people say, well, we're in the same country, it doesn't really matter. So likewise, I, uh, the most perspective is more grand than that. We're in the same race, so it doesn't matter. You see, we're a part of the same people, so we're all human beings, so it doesn't, doesn't matter. It, 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 the flags is, is not really an issue. And as I said, the Islamic perspective was it was just first used as a tool just for in battle so you can identify who was who on the battlefield and so on. Apart from that, it didn't really have any, you know, the, 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 the Islamic states from that point in time onwards never sp did, did spend a lot of time flying their flag in, in, in peacetime because it was seen as uh, there's no point to it. Uh, obviously, until they became the imperial cultures, which they assimilated and then they kind of learned about ostentation and pomp and so on. So I, I would say that it doesn't really, it's, it's, it's neither here nor there regarding localized flags or not. What I would say is essentially that. Um, the flag is an identifier of the nation that you're, you're under, and it, you know, it's a political geography, I guess. In that sense, you know, that it has this functional purpose uh, for the Muslim and for the Christian and for the Jew. And uh, it serves so useful when you're going around to other countries to know which country you're in, just look at the flag. So, there's, uh, that's, that's, it can right, help. Thank you. I'm a bit conscious of the time, actually. Are you around for lunch? Yes. Excellent. So, uh, I'm sure there are going to be lots of questions for you over, over lunch. So, thank, thank you very much for that yeah. wonderful yeah. presentation. presentation. Mr. Andrew uh, uh, Rosendale, MP, uh, to come and give us a, a short presentation on the ongoing flag campaign. It's great to be here uh, back as a Member of Parliament but because the Flag Institute, uh, Malcolm particularly and Graham, myself, have worked together on a number of things relating to uh, establishing a group within Parliament to highlight many of the issues that you are debating today, discussing today, very important. <coughs> the fact that we have no proper rules in this country about flying the flag, we have uh, no established traditions which are set in stone, everything is a muddle and I believe very strongly that there needs to be uh, some degree of discipline about what we do in this country 
with regard to flying the flag. I believe uh, that identity matters. And I have lots of different identities. Uh, my first identity is being British. And I'm uh, deeply proud of being British and believe that as a member of parliament, uh, my first duty is to Queen and country and to Britain, to the United Kingdom. Uh, and that's my first priority. And that's why I've always championed the belief that the Union flag should always be flown above public buildings, that we should champion uh, the importance of flying the flag of our country in schools, local organisations, and that's something I'm continuing to campaign for. Identity matters. A flag is not something that you, um, uh, you worship, but it's something you have respect for, it's something you honour, it's something you have pride in, it's something that you look at and have real belief in.